animals want more than we eat. Where are we from? Life is rooted in the Death Republic. Where are we going? Our seat returns to Death Republic. These cheery sentiments. These cheery sentiments should inspire. Okay, so welcome back to the fifth episode episode of the Grey Matters podcast series. I really hope you've been enjoying the episodes so far. Today we're going to be looking at Lanark and the City and I'm delighted to be joined today by Lisa Lefebvre. Lisa is a curator, writer, editor and the inaugural executive director of the Hope Smithson Foundation. So Lisa, lovely to see you. Thank you for joining me here today. Ah, it's all my pleasure to think about Lanark is something, well, I mean, really, what, what could be better than doing that? <laughs> Oh, well, good. Thank you. Well, let's kick off first of all with maybe your first experience of reading the novel then. You know, when when did you first read it? Maybe set the scene a little bit about what you were doing at the time and what, what impact it had on you also. You know, it's a really good question and I'm not going to be able to answer it very well because I can't remember when I first started reading it. I've got the feeling that this could be completely wrong that I first started reading it when I was studying architecture and I was a terrible architecture student, really, really awful. I didn't have the wit to be able to create buildings, but I became very interested in the city. And in my misty memory of Lanark is it was one of these books that I had for a long time. And I don't know about you, but there's certain books in my life that I've read and they've taken me a long time to read. So Thomas Pynchon's Mason and Dixon is one, and so is Lanark. And I remember struggling and struggling with reading it, but wanting to read it. And then I remember with such clarity, the moments when I hit the stride of the narrative with all of its winding parts, and I could not stop reading the book. But what's really interesting is this species of books, they always stay with me. And I can remember with such precision certain passages in the book. And in fact, before our conversation the, this morning, I picked up Lanark from my bookshelf. And in fact, I seem to have three copies of Lanark, which also happens quite often when I really love a book. And I was flicking through it and everything was so familiar. It didn't matter where I opened the, the book. So for me, I guess my memory of reading the book in a way echoes mm -hmm. the structure of the book itself, that it's in and out of imagination and experience. Um, and what I do know is that one of the wonderful things of having more years behind you is that I know this is a book that has really informed the way I think about urban spaces and all urban spaces. Um, and I think that's the, that's the brilliance of great writing is it might start with the personal, it might start with something incredibly specific, but then it rolls out like a, a long tongue to speak to all other urban places. Can you talk a little bit more about that then? What was it in particular about the urban spaces? I mean, obviously you're, you're saying that it was hard to kind of get into it. I know other people have mentioned that and I wonder if, you know, the format, the playing around with, it's not in the kind of chronological order of the books and the sequencing, mm -hmm. but this, these sort of dual worlds, which seem separate but are together, um, you know, can you talk a little bit maybe about that and these sort of spaces that he created, I guess, in sort of real biographical sections and maybe sort of unthank otherworldly sections? Well, I think for me, that's why the book was a struggle to read and that's why it's so brilliant. And one of the things that I think Lanark shows us is so-called realism, mirror realism or photocopy realism, however you want, want to talk about it, is less real than something that weaves together different understandings. So the truth is, and I think this happens for everyone, I don't think this just happens for me, is the way that we experience places. So let's think about the way that we experience cities. It's not just about 
what you see, what you smell, what you hear, what you perceive. It's about how that interlocks with your own memory, with your own narratives. Um, and what I really love about urban space, and this only seems to happen for me in urban space, is some days you have this crystal clear precision of perception. And you can see a city as if it's uh, a geology of different lives that have been lived. And I think with, with Lanark, it's a book that is a biography of a person, a biography of a city, a biography of um, social class, a biography of language, a biography of architecture. And it's not that we're hearing one person's story, we're hearing all these different layers and maybe that's why it feels so applicable mm. to other spaces. And I suppose, I suppose I haven't thought about this before, but I suppose when I reflect on Lanark, it reminds me of the way that I see cities. Mm. Um, so earlier this morning, I left, I'm talking to you from London, I left my flat, I went out to the shops to get some coffee and some milk, the classic morning thing to do. And of course, when I'm walking around, I'm walking around and I'm seeing and layering up experiences. I'm walking around a, a part of a city that I know very well, that I, I've lived for 25 years. Um, and it all builds up experience. Um, and it might be a street corner with a tree on it that's completely past remarkable. Mm. But it means something when you consider the lived experience. And when I think about Lanark, that's what it's doing. Mm. It's that lived experience. Mm. And then I suppose the, the other thing is that, and I know this contradicts what I just said, but for me, this book really conjures up the specifics of Glasgow as well. Um, so I feel that I can see as a non-Glasgow person, I can see um, those cobbled streets that are in between buildings. Um, and that's what's so great, isn't it? When you go to a city that isn't yours, mm -hmm. is you notice things. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't think of many places that has those very, very particular alleyways and they feel like alleyways of adventure. Mm -hmm. And I, I always have those sights in my mind when I think about Lanark. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting to pick up on, because I guess for many people that reimagining of Glasgow really happened with Lanark. So before that, even though, as you're saying, those lived experiences and that city was there, still there and people were still existing within it, it's because no one had, um, I guess, imagined it and brought it to life within a work of fiction like that. So it's interesting for you to experience Glasgow through the book and then to come to it and how, yeah, this reimagining of it. And, and I think the layering too is something that I know Alistair talks about, um, you know, even within his writing, within his pictures too, how he physically would layer up um, words when he was writing. So they become almost like maps with, you know, forms moving up and down and this sort of mapping of the city too, which I think it's really interesting that you've picked up on that, that kind of layering that happens that also appears, I think, within the visual too. Um, I wondered if you, I mean, I know obviously you're, you, you've you um, presented Alistair's work before in, in your role as a curator, if there's links between that way of perceiving a city within his words and within his images, and if there's some connection there that you'd like to maybe talk about a bit more. Yeah, when I think about Alistair's work, I do think about it as a map. Um, and it's a map of a life and a place. And for me, I think I first came across Alistair's work through Lanark. And then um, I went down a research wormhole to try and find out everything <laughs> I could. And in fact, to the left hand side of where you can see me, is I can see them on the top shelf actually. I think every book that's ever been published on or by Alistair Gray because I just wanted to know everything. And then when I started to see the images and his drawings, I completely fell in love with them. And rather like his writing, 
with that etched in my memory. There's certain drawings that I can remember every single detail. So I almost feel that I was sitting on the corner of Alexander's bed with his quilt because that image is, it's my favorite, favorite uh, drawing by Alistair. There is this sense of um, language mapping and language geography. So maybe it's not just mapping, it's, it's more than that. So for me, Alistair is, and I don't know if you'll agree with this, is first and foremost an artist who moves across different media that could be a mural, it could be talking, it could be drawing, it could be writing, it could be mythologizing. So in a way, and this was one of the reasons why we really wanted to invite him to be a part of the, the British Art Show, is his work seems so contemporary, mm. contemporary 10 years ago or so, um, but contemporary now in that he chose the medium that was right for what he wanted to bring to mm -hmm. others and and I really feel that his work is although it's biographical although it's expressive it's not it's not selfish it's not some kind of self-expression mm -hmm. I really feel that his work is an invitation to think about what's around you and to think about how you actually perceive. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're, as, as we're talking, I keep on thinking, well, yes, I have a narrative in my head when I'm reading, when I'm thinking. And he almost gives us permission mm -hmm. to think our dark thoughts mm -hmm. while we're happy mm -hmm. and to think our happy thoughts while we're dark. Yeah, and to be honest, I think about layering it laying that out and exposing it in a sense to and that idea of not a failure but it's okay to as you're saying to kind of have those high points and those low points too and I think connecting back to something you said earlier that idea of um you know using the biographical or something very personal but in a way allowing that to open up and have these universal conversations and dialogues that I think is so important and um, particularly at the time that we're currently in where life feels quite respected for many people to still be able to feel that you can, you know, reach out or, or communicate, I think is really important too, isn't it? What is there anything you, you think that we you could learn from some of those spaces or places that he created within Lanark, these sort of cities or other environments? I think there is so much to learn, mm -hmm. actually. I think what we can learn from him is to pay attention, mm -hmm. to pay attention to what's around you. Um, and maybe this is one of the um, qualities that we have coming out of the pandemic because we can't move around much. Um, so, and you can't do that much, but what you can do is you can walk through where you live mm -hmm. and you can pay attention in a way that Alistair teaches us to pay attention. And the pandemic is a horrific time. There's been so many people who've been lost. It has completely underlined the structural inequalities within society in every single location. And it's perhaps taught us to pay attention, to pay attention to those inequalities, to pay attention to the alleyway beside the pub that you would never think of walking down, to pay attention to the roads that normally there's a ton of traffic zooming down, but just to walk it at 11 o'clock at night. There's this sense, I think, that Alistair teaches us that we can own our cities. We can own them by being in them, by talking about them, by looking, feeling, and when I think about the way that he encourage us, encourages us to own our cities, it's using all of the senses. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about what you see. There's a number of passages in Lanark where he's talking about the stink, mm -hmm. uh, metaphorical and literal stink. 
and then the sounds as well and almost the palpable touch of your feet on on the ground so i think we can learn from lanark that cities are special places mm -hmm. they're ugly and they're filthy and they're really quite disgusting mm -hmm. and they're glorious mm -hmm. and they're full of possibilities and we can invent ourselves mm -hmm. we can invent others we can dream of a better time mm -hmm. and make it happen as well yeah that seems a really pertinent thing to think about particularly right now is as you say most people are living in a restricted way and noticing the beauty or otherness that is around them in, in the familiar, but in things that you, you know, life has a certain pace to it, doesn't it, that often those details get lost. And I think that's a really beautiful thing to think about and to focus on that you've pulled out there um, through Lanark and through talking about what a lot of people are going through right now. It's um, focusing a light on those everyday making a cup of coffee, the sensory and visual and other, all the different experiences around doing that and just pausing sometimes, isn't it? Just that ability to pause and to reflect on where you are at that, at that point in time. And maybe even, I mean, it's something that um, I think is um, really chiming with the book to almost give, um, give thanks for city spaces, mm -hmm. to have that, take that pleasure from them because they are there and in the gloom there's there's something something to look at yep, and yep. i think there's that there's nothing in a way in lanark that is about classical beauty um about an idealistic idea of a a golden city mm. yet it is a dream city that he's making a dream mm. city of possibilities yeah Absolutely. Do you think, I mean, interesting to think about now and um, artists and makers, writers, and the experience currently, this idea that we're talking about, sort of pausing and taking note of things. Or do you think there will be, I mean, it's bound to, right, what the impact will be now of the current situation in terms of making and new ways of looking and thinking that will come out from it? I, I think so. And I think at this moment, so this is the end of March 2021. And in fact, you might be able to hear it too. I can hear out of my window, the school across the street from where I live. It's the first day back today. And I think that there's this moment of hope of being able to, so here in, in England, um, from today, you're permitted to spend time with six people outdoors. This is so exciting that you can do such things. And I think what's going to happen for artists now and for perceivers of art is just this joy mm -hmm. in looking mm -hmm. at art. Um, and also I think um, this is my crystal ball prediction. I think everyone is hungry to read more books because yeah, we spent so much time staring at this little rectangular screen. And it's not the same as when you look at a book and you see the words on the page. And because I've now evoked it in my mind, I, I want to see Alexander underneath his beautiful quilt. I want to see with my own eyes, the texture of that drawing. Mm. And maybe it comes back again to this sense of paying attention so maybe there will be just a hunger mm. for culture, but culture that isn't about glossing over mm -hmm. lived experience. And this is what Alistair does so brilliantly. It's not saying everything is lovely and wonderful. It's saying everything is pretty awful mm -hmm. and it's also wonderful. Yeah. So maybe yeah. this, oh, yeah. this hunger. Yeah, oh. the truth and beauty and beauty and truth in a way too. It just when you picked that up there, it made me think too, we haven't really spoken about the object, but you obviously had said from being used to the virtual experience of talking and um, engaging, obviously what a visual, beautiful object Lanark is too. And, you know, I, I love that even the, the cover, the, using the sort of old techniques of almost creating a visual, visual signifier and giving you little clues about what might happen. Um, and allude to which might happen to later in the text. But can you talk about a bit about, you know, you obviously got to know Alistair's work through Lanark and that kind of connection between 
the visual and the literary and what you thought about that? I think that um, when I reflect on the way that Alistair works through the visual and the literary, I think both are languages, mm -hmm. languages of observation. Um, and I think that in a way, um, when he's writing, he's writing against the failures of language. Mm -hmm. And when he's drawing, he's drawing against the failures of drawing. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why when I think of his work, I think about it as a, a total artistic practice that Lanark is, is not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and the drawings are not enough. Mm -hmm. And together they create this evocation of, of per perception. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see him as really stretching things to their, their limits. Yeah. Um, and maybe working against them. Yeah, absolutely. I think he would. He mentioned that that idea of feeling when he went to art school about having to be categorised. You know, now I think it's acceptable that you can work between mediums and you don't need to be defined by one thing. But I think that was a struggle definitely for him. People couldn't understand why he wrote and painted and made murals. He had to be one thing or another and to just say, well, I'm, I'm going to do all and, and not be restricted. I think there's something really, um, and it, it is all the work, isn't it? It all um, weaves and, and connects too. Um, have, you, have you got a favorite passage that you'd like to read or share with us today? Well, you know, you, you mentioned in advance of this conversation that you were going to ask me that. And I'll tell you something that I did this morning. In fact, I did this for about two hours this morning. The way this book is, is you could just open it up anywhere. <laughs> and there's, there's, something, there's something there. Um, and it's just quite incredible. Yeah. But I will say that, um, and I, I know that it's something that you, you've heard me say, say before, I just love the opening of yeah. Lanark. Um, because it takes you somewhere else um, and he starts off by describing the elite cafe and what's so interesting about the opening of this book is it doesn't give anything away where the narrator is so is the narrator dreaming of going to the elite is the narrator um, the person who doesn't speak, who makes the coffee. Is the narrator the very skinny young man outside? Is the narrator one of the people who's laughing and joking? And in that first two pages, when Alistair describes the elite, he says there's all these different cliques. Um, which one would you join? Well, which one was Alistair part of? Would he be looking at them all? And what I love about that passage is it invites this freedom of difference of opinions. And it also reflects this sense of how do we decide who we want to become? So when I read that description of the elite, I want to go there, but I also know that it's a place for people who are maybe in their late teens, early twenties, when you're trying to work out who you are and trying to work out who you are also means which clique do you sit with? Do you sit with the feminists? Do you sit with the socialists? Do you sit with the people who um, are complaining? Do you sit with the people who are laughing? It almost feels that it's an opening of a book that is inviting you, the reader, in and it's your choice where you're going to be yeah. and I think why I love this beginning of a book so much is it's written with generosity and perhaps that's something that Alistair's writing and drawings and murals and humanness mm -hmm. um, always persists as being mm. an invitation to share yeah. and to choose. Yeah. Um, Great, you've picked up on that, absolutely that. 
um, generosity of spirit that not just him but the community around him there was a you know real support and you see it right even within Lanark um, the list of plagiarisms telling you where to go what to learn you know nothing's made in a vacuum is it you have to like it's pointing to other artists other writers um, but yeah that generosity of spirit I think comes across in the work doesn't it it's not um, someone telling you what you should feel or think it's saying coming you come with your lived life experience and bring it and negotiate this yourself I think that's really powerful that's a really powerful message isn't it Completely, completely. And I think that's why Alistair's work in all the ways that we've been talking about it is something that endures. Mm -hmm. It will endure. And there's, um, it's got this inbuilt flexibility, chameleon-like quality um, that means it can be read in so many different ways by so many different people and in so many different times. Great Lisa, well would you like to read the little passage for us now? I'd well, love to. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then maybe this is something else to say as well is that um, you know great writing um, it encourages you to read it out loud. Mm -hmm. This is what's just so so wonderful. So um, this is the very start of Lanark. The elite cafe was entered by a staircase from the foyer of a cinema. A landing two thirds of the way up had a door into the cinema itself, but people going to the elite climbed farther and came to a large dingy looking room full of chairs and low coffee tables. The room seemed dingy, not because it was unclean, but because of the lighting. A crimson carpet covered the floor. The chairs were upholstered in scarlet. The low ceiling was patterned with walled pink plaster, but dim green wall lights turned these collars into varieties of brown and made the skin of the customers look grayish and dead. So for me, what does that mean when a book starts with that? And then of course you have to remember that before you've even got to that, you're seeing the frontispieces yeah. And you know that you're starting at book three. What is going on yeah. here? It's yeah. complete time travel. And yeah. even though I know if I go to the elite and my skin is going to look grayish and dead and it is not going to be filthy, but it's going to seem filthy. I want to go there and I want to imagine what it might be like. And I want to feel the specialness of climbing those stairs and knowing I'm going to the cinema where I will suspend my disbelief for two hours, 10 minutes, but I don't even have to go to the cinema. I need to just climb those stairs mm -hmm. and look at the crimson and the green and the pink, and I'm in another world. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's inviting us mm -hmm. to do. So maybe it's that sense that as we're talking, I'm suddenly thinking, wouldn't it be amazing if Alistair would have managed in his long enough life to have made a full on feature length film? What would that I know. have looked like? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> don't, yeah, I don't know if we should pause it there or not, but I absolutely, yeah, I think it, con it conjures up such a vivid world, doesn't it? That I think, well, I don't know if you ever saw when you were into Alistair's flat, he did draw a storyboard for a version of the film, which was amazing in itself, just this idea of, because as you say, it's so visually rich, but it allows you space to create your, so my version of the elite is probably gonna be a little bit different from yours and a little bit different from the next person's, but to see him distill it into a drawing, I thought was really interesting, but maybe also difficult to do too, because it's so, as you're saying, it allows that space, doesn't it, for interpretation and for you to bring your, your real life experience to it but yeah absolutely what a feature film that would be yeah oh well Lisa it was fantastic <laughs> to talk to you today thank you for sharing your uh, brilliant perceptive insights into to Lanark and for that beautiful reading at the end thank you mm -hmm. thank you Zoya. I've always felt that stories and pictures were 
a way of keeping people I knew alive and as they were. 